Are you ashamed of using consumables? Do you feel anxious when you use a powerful spell to win a tough fight? Maybe you're going to need it later on for an even harder battle, and you just screwed yourself by using it now. You should probably reload an earlier save and try to win the fight without wasting it. This is a very common thought process among people who play RPGs. One that turns interesting mechanics into a bunch of items that do nothing more than decorate your inventory. And it's hard to fault the players for this mentality. What if there is a fight later on that's completely unbalanced and requires the player to have a stockpile of consumables? Isn't it better just to be safe? I'll admit that there isn't an easy answer to this problem. Most of the time, I think that games should just do away with consumables entirely and move to a system where your resources regenerate, like the Estus Flask from Dark Souls. But there are games that use consumables in an interesting way, and Gothic 2 is one of those games. Today, I want to talk about the spell scrolls from Gothic 2. These items allow you to cast spells that you otherwise couldn't, such as transforming into a creature, summoning a monster, or making a special attack. Spell scrolls are incredibly powerful, letting you tackle quests and monsters that you otherwise couldn't. However, there's a limited number in the entire game, and once you use them up, they're gone for good. This initially sounds like a nightmare scenario for item hoarding, where you would never use something so powerful if there was a chance you wouldn't find another. But as I played through the game, I found that this couldn't be further from the truth. I found tons of opportunities where I was excited to use my scrolls, because the scenario I was presented with was worth it. So how does the game accomplish this? How did the developers take a notoriously stubborn problem and flip it on its head, turning consumable items into a highly engaging part of the game? Well, Gothic 2's scrolls are designed around three key concepts that encourage players to use them. First, the game offers massive rewards for using scrolls effectively, such as experience, loot, and access to new areas. Second, the game gives you subtle hints to let you know which enemies, quests, and areas are worth spending scrolls on. And third, the game never punishes you for running out of scrolls, by giving you alternate solutions to all the important content. It all leads to a system that makes using consumables fun and exciting, rather than anxious and regretful. Let's start with the rewards. In Gothic 2, your level and stats are the two main factors that determine what you can do in the world. There will of course be certain players who are better at combat than others, but in Karenis, strength matters more than skill. This means that leveling up and getting better gear are top priorities. You can certainly get there by killing low-level monsters, but since enemies don't respawn, you'll constantly have to scour the map to find more. The faster way to get stronger is to take on tough monsters. Trolls, shadow beasts, and demons all offer incredible amounts of experience to a low-level player, and drop valuable loot that can be traded for better equipment. You'll have absolutely no chance in a fair fight, but scrolls let you balance the scales to reap these rewards. Whenever I used a scroll to fell one of these beasts, I never felt guilty about doing so. In other games, with less powerful enemies, I would have wondered if I really needed one to win the fight. However, when you're up against an enemy that can one-shot you, it's pretty clear that some extra help is justified, and the experience and loot reinforces that it's worth it. Scrolls also let you complete quests far earlier than you normally could. Much like the monsters, quests each have their own level of difficulty, and rewards to go along with it. The game expects you to complete them in order, but there's nothing actually stopping you from doing the harder ones first. This gives us more flexibility as we take on various assignments. In my last Gothic 2 video, I told you about my experience with the quest Dragomir's Crossbow. At the time, I was a bit underleveled for the area, but still managed to complete the quest by using some scrolls. The main enemies stopping you from getting the crossbow are these two undead goblins, which at the time were far stronger than me. However, I was still able to get past them by using some destroy undead scrolls. This wasn't the most efficient use of these scrolls, as many people pointed out in the comments, but it allowed me to complete the quest before I normally could, and in my opinion, was totally worth it. Next, let's talk about how the game lets you know when to use a scroll. Creating opportunities to use scrolls doesn't mean much if the player never notices them so the game employs a large number of techniques to make these situations obvious. Let's start with a simple one. Big enemy equals strong enemy. There are not that many creatures that tower over the nameless hero, but the ones that do are all incredibly strong. Trolls, dragons, and golems are all some of the toughest enemies in Karenis, and the game uses their size to make that immediately obvious. 
the game continues to expand this concept with the Shrink Monster Scroll, an item that shrinks a single enemy's size and makes them significantly weaker. By phrasing it as a Shrink Scroll instead of just a weakened scroll, the game reinforces the idea that large monsters are naturally stronger. It also gives a hint that large enemies are the best target for this item. This is true both because it's an effective way to take them out, and because it's fun to watch a troll turn into a little homunculus. Gothic also uses its lore to clue you into opportunities. Throughout the series, the game's story has always been in sync with its world design. This narrative consistency lets you know which areas will be the most challenging and the most rewarding. Let me tell you about a time that I used the game's lore to find a valuable item. When I first explored the Valley of Mines, I knew I wanted to return to Zardus' old tower. Zardus was one of the most powerful characters in Gothic 1, and I was sure his old home would be full of valuable items and powerful monsters. Sure enough, the tower was crawling with creatures he had summoned, including a demon and some skeletons. Getting through was not going to be easy, but I was sure that I would find something incredible at the top, so I decided to use some scrolls to push my way through. I used a shrink monster scroll on the demon, and a couple destroy undead scrolls on the skeletons. This was a lot of resources, but in Zardus' room, I found something that made my investment worth it. The Master Sword. This sword is incredibly powerful for only requiring 60 dexterity, and it became my main weapon for the majority of the game. Without knowledge of the game's lore, I simply would have turned around and come back when I was stronger. But because I knew the history of the tower, I decided to fight on and spend my resources, which ultimately paid off. Lore is an incredibly powerful tool for guiding the player through a game's world, and works great in Gothic because the gameplay has always stayed true to the narrative. The last way the game gives hints is through dialogue with NPCs. Quest givers, mentors, and random civilians all have a lot to say about the world, and aren't shy about giving you useful information. They might warn you to stay away from a dangerous area. If you go deeper into the woods here, you'll run into some very evil fellows. Or talk excitedly about the treasure up ahead. I just want a bit of gold. Dragons have gold, don't they? Certainly. These bits of information are all incredibly reliable, so you never end up feeling slighted by a character who blew things out of proportion. When an NPC tells you that a certain monster means business, you can take that as a fact. But I've seen what it can do. Even wolves aren't safe from it. The beast even bit the head off of one. Each of these hint types are certainly effective on their own but they're at their best when you put them together. As a team, they create an incredibly cohesive and well-explained world. It becomes almost intuitive to know where the big dangers and prizes lurk, and this understanding allows players to use their scrolls confidently, pushing forward for the rewards that they know are there. At this point, we know Gothic provides massive incentives for using scrolls, and that these opportunities are communicated to the player through a wide array of hints. However, none of this would work if the game then turned around and punished the player for not hoarding. This is why the last leg of the design is to make sure there are no situations where scrolls are required to progress. While scrolls are certainly a welcome addition to the game, it would be totally possible to play through Gothic 2 without them. You would have a lot less flexibility in what order to take on the content, but there would never be a moment where you simply couldn't progress, because even the toughest monsters can be taken down with just a sword. This lets players use their consumables without fear of getting stuck, and allows for the freedom to try fun and inventive strategies. There was actually an exception to this rule in Gothic 1, but Piranha Bytes decided to remove it for the second game. The transform into Meatbug Scroll allowed you to crawl into small spaces, it was necessary to access a critical area during the main quest. I think the developers made a great call by moving away from this type of design, as it sends mixed messages on how scrolls are intended to be used. After you use your meatbug scroll to progress the story, you might start to wonder if there are other spots in the game that require scrolls, and this could easily convince you to start hoarding. By moving away from this type of design, scrolls provide a far clearer and more intentional place in the game's mechanics. They exist to provide large but ultimately unnecessary bursts of power that allow you to accomplish things currently above your character's strength. They offer a strand of leniency in an otherwise unforgiving world, and allow players to break away from the standard order of events. Gothic 2 does so well with scrolls because it thoroughly understands their place in the game. For many developers, the decision to include powerful consumables doesn't go far beyond the fantasy of how cool they would be. It's added because it sounds awesome, and because players expect it in a high fantasy setting. But Gothic's system of difficult, open-ended gameplay provides a reason for their existence, and the game executes on it beautifully. 
Thanks for watching.